In today's video, we're going to find out if a common fluorite crystal dug right out of the ground can be used to detect gamma radiation. It's important to quickly review what is inside a typical gamma scintillation detector. Up in the front, you have a sodium iodide detection crystal, which, when exposed to radioactive sources, specifically gamma-emitting radioactive sources, causes very small scintillations of light. These scintillations are so dim that they cannot be seen by the naked eye. That is where the photomultiplier tube comes in. This takes those very small scintillations of light, amplifies them, and converts them into electrical pulses. Those electrical pulses are then fed out the back of the photomultiplier tube and routed to your typical rate meter where they are converted into counts where you can quantify the amount of radiation coming from your radioactive source. So in today's test, we are going to take this commercially made crystal out of the equation. We're gonna go ahead and put this here and we are going to replace it with something literally dug right out of the ground. The only thing that has been done to this crystal is it was cut with a uh, lapidary saw and we have a nice flat mating surface for the face of the detection crystal. So we're just gonna go ahead and put that there. And we're going to see if a normal ground sourced rock, in this case, can take the gamma from the radioactive source cause some scintillations and be detected through the photomultiplier tube and rate meter assembly. So let's take a closer look at this fluorite sample uh, before we start. I picked this up probably about 10 years ago for around $2.50, maybe a little bit more from a local lapidary show. And the only thing I have done was I used a lapidary saw and made this rough cut on the bottom. It's been lightly polished. You can see it's absolutely far from anything professional, but it does have some optical clarity, perhaps enough to uh, allow the scintillations, if any actually occur, to be detected by the photomultiplier tube. And for what it's worth, as you know, I've restored a whole bunch of uh, scintillation detectors over the years. And when removing the old sodium iodide crystals from uh, these detectors that were built in the 1950s, um, their optical clarity is way, way, way worse than this. In fact, you know what? Let's set this aside real quick and I will show you a typical sodium iodide crystal from 1955. Okay, so here's a good comparison. You can see the optical clarity of these older crystals is practically nil. There's just not much at all. And look at this, this is compared to how they look when they were brand new. They're so clear you can see all the way to the bottom. And a surprising note, these still work. Now, they don't work with, the, obviously, the original efficiency they had back when they were new in 1955 or 1954, but they still put out a remarkable amount of gamma detection that you would never expect from something that looks like a couple of yellow hockey pucks. Uh, so, I'm not too worried about the lack of polishing on the face of this crystal. Um, I'm just more curious if this is actually going to work. And uh, I'll kind of explain why I have my suspicions that it'll work um, after we do the test. So let's move on to actually, there we go, to actually building this thing, which is pretty simple. I'm going to take some optical coupling grease. I'm going to put it on the front of the uh, crystal and also on the mating side of the uh, photomultiplier tube. And we're going to tape it up in typical old-fashioned standard and uh, hook it up to the rate meter and see how it goes. Okay, so in the interest of time, I am going to speed up the video while I apply the optical coupling grease and then uh, start taping this whole thing up. And um, we'll go from there, see how it works.
Okay, so before I continue, just so you can see the mating surface, it's on there, optical coupling grease is in place. And uh, let's go ahead and continue. All right, that was fairly easy. The reason this whole entire tube is wrapped up in tape is because this is a highly sensitive photomultiplier tube, the last thing you want is to have ambient light getting into the photomultiplier tube and contaminate the count rate. And I can tell you right now, if you had any of the actual tube exposed where light could get into it, you would have a massive avalanche of counts. It would go from a standard background count of just a few counts per second to thousands upon thousands of counts. It would just completely overload the system. So anyway, you need to get block out all light from the photomultiplier tube and crystal so you can have an absolutely pure or as close to pure as you can get gamma count. Okay, so with that being said, let's go ahead and introduce the rate meter that we're gonna use, which is the Ledlam 2221. Okay, so this is a Ludlum Model 2221 rate meter. And what's nice about this unit is it can work with Geiger tubes, scintillation detectors, and neutron detectors. It's got everything that the nucleus has, plus a whole bunch more. Um, it has a typical count rate. It's got a scalar digital rate. It's got the analog meter. It's got a digital meter. And um, the best thing of all are these adjustments right here. And it allows you to adjust the threshold, high voltage, and all sorts of other different things in order to make it work with different types of detector tubes, or in this case, crystals. And I will point out that because we're using a very low quality detection crystal, as opposed to something that's industry standard like this, it's going to have a kind of a different response. Um, so I will tell you right now, I'm going to have to lower the threshold to quite a bit in order for it to be able to pick up the low-level scintillations from uh, that fluorite crystal. So let's go ahead and see what we've got. Um, I've dropped the threshold down to 64, and let's go ahead and plug this thing in and introduce that uh, uranium ore sample and see what we can detect. All right, so I've got the 2221 set up with a light kind of illuminating the dial. You'll be able to see the digital readout and the analog gauge. So let's go ahead and connect this. And go ahead and turn it on. All right, we're already getting a little bit of background count. So let's go ahead and um, do a one minute time count and I'll speed up the camera in the interest of time. Okay, 16 counts per minute. That's actually a little bit more than I expected. I mean, how efficient is a rock dug out of the ground? Um, now, given the fact that I had to lower the threshold quite a bit in order to um, make this work, uh, that 16 counts per minute uh, could be a lot of different things. It probably is just normal background radiation. It's also probably a combination of that and uh, some electronic artifacts. Um, I mean, all sorts of different things. So, um, or it could even be, uh, like earlier mentioned, uh, potassium contaminants within the matrix of the uh, fluorite crystal itself causing some counts. Regardless, that's actually a very, very, very surprising count rate. I thought it would be closer to actually zero. So 16 is pretty darn good for registering background. All right, for the moment we're all been waiting for, let's go ahead and introduce the uranium ore source. This is a low-level uranium ore source, otherwise known as gummite. And let's go ahead and uh, kind of see what we got. All right, that is a significant response. Do it 
away. Counts go down. Move it back. Counts go up. Wow, that's actually, that is seriously remarkable. Let's go ahead and do a time count and see actually how many counts per minute we've got. Wow, 420 counts per minute. You know, I was looking at the, this rock here. It's got some black pitchy area here, which is probably has a higher concentration of the uh, important material. Let's see if we can point this towards the detector and see if that makes any difference. Yeah, that's a little bit more. All right, let's go ahead and do one more time count. All right, 505 counts. Let's turn this volume down a little bit. You know, it's also possible that um, certain sides of this crystal might be a little bit more effective at uh, detection than others. There could be a lot of factors here at play. That's a little faster. Let's go ahead and do one more time count with that. That was even better, 704 counts per minute. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, first of all, we can tell that it's not as sensitive as a regular um, commercially made sodium iodide crystal. So. Um, that is a major takeaway and the fact that you cannot expect anything close to the same efficiency um, as with something like this. Now, I've got two types of uh, fluorite crystals here. And I should note that before using the purple fluorite crystal, I made a uh, nice surface on the bottom of a green crystal. Now, I will tell you, other than the standard matrix that's found in fluorite, um, the green crystals primarily have um, iron within them, um, and which kind of gives it its green color. And uh, there's really nothing other than that that's notable for the purposes of um, accommodating a scintillation system or being able to create the flashes of light you need to detect gamma radiation. So uh, I can tell you right now, this was an absolute fail. I got absolutely no counts from it whatsoever. I've tried everything under the sun, um, up to including introducing x-rays, a small source from like a smoke detector, but it still absolutely did not uh, generate any response whatsoever. Then I moved on and tried the purple crystals. Now, one of the interesting things about these purple fluorite crystals is they contain three elements which are absolutely crucial to a um, crystal-based scintillation detect detection system. Europium being number one, which is a very common dopant used in uh, scintillation systems that create the scintillations that you need for a uh, photomultiplier to detect. And it also contains cerium and yttrium, two others that are crucial for um, scintillation detectors. So because of those natural um, additions within the crystal matrix, these tend to work. Uh, these typically either come from Mexico or China. There very well could be sources here in the United States or North America, but whenever you go on the net or go to the lapidary shows, um, it seems like most of these things come from Mexico, Central America, or China. 
All right, so before we conclude, let's do one more test. I have three industrial test sources, all exempt and low quantity, um, from of cesium-137, cobalt-60, and europium-152. So let's see how the crystal reacts to each type. Now remember, each one of these types of um, radiations put out a different energy spectrum, which has a different sort of... Um, scintillation response within the crystal matrix. So I would expect these things to respond a little bit differently from one another um, compared to that of a regular sodium iodide or cesium iodide commercial that is, or crystal that's commercially made. So let's go ahead and first try the cesium-137. And you can see there's not much of a response at all. Maybe if I had this in the lead castle for a while, I might be able to pick up a couple of extra counts per minute, but right now I'm not really hearing too much. All right, so let's move on to the cobalt 60 test source, which has a different energy um, output than the uh, cesium 137. Okay, so the crystal does like that. Okay, and let's move on to the Europium-152 test source. Okay, so not as good as the cobalt-60, but better than the cesium-137. But it appears none of them are a match for good old uranium ore. Okay, if you found this content interesting and you'd like to see more, I've got a whole bunch of other subjects coming up in the near future. So please consider subscribing if you want to uh, be alerted to future uploads. All right, we'll see you all in the next one.